one I can tell because I can hear myself. Um, I'm Peter Heinrich, and I am a developer evangelist with Amazon. Um, I come from actually primarily a games development background, but I also worked on Amazon's retail site early on back in the 90s. So if you've ever used the wish list, that was my first major project. Um, but I've also been an indie developer, so I know what it means to really uh, strive for every sale and uh, what it means to make every sale count. So now I help developers build apps for mobile, and I help them make their apps successful. So uh, please take a moment if you have a chance. Follow me on Twitter. Um, you know, if just if just one person were to follow me, just a single person, that's really not enough. I need everybody in the room <laughs> to follow me. So you may have some definition in your mind of what a power user is, and that's fine. I'm going to present my own for the purposes of this discussion, but my guess is that they're probably pretty similar. And I guarantee that, that we, that is the mobile industry, uh, we're not the first ones to think of power users as a group. So I love this, I love this guy's hair. Actually, this is what I would do with mine if I had the curl for it. But, um, but the concept of power users is actually more than 100 years old. Um, it could be even more. The, the earliest paper that I could find on the subject dates from the mid-1890s, so it's been around for a while. They're not new, and they appear across all kinds of industries. So they have interests in a lot of different areas, not just games, not just casinos. You think about the sports fans, for instance, with season tickets or who pay thousands and thousands of dollars, dollars pounds, to go to the championship games. Uh, think about the music fans who follow a particular band all over the country to see every show. You can think about the collectors who collect whatever. It doesn't really matter. It could be stamps. It could be something else. But these are the people who spend more money than the average user does on what they're really passionate about. My aunt loved anything with a pig on it. If it had a pig, she bought it. Um, made uh, holiday visits kind of scary, but uh, she was really into pigs. So the paper that I mentioned, the one from the 1890s, uh, didn't talk about power users directly. Vilfredo Pareto actually developed the principle of the 80-20 rule. And he came up with this because he noticed that about 80% of the peas in his garden were coming from 20% of the pods is kind of interesting, but it caused him to do a little investigation into other statistical um, sets, and he found that, coincidentally, about 80% of the land in Italy at the time was owned by 20% of the population. So it's led to this kind of general rule of thumb in business, which is 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers. Now, Geron had a name. Oh, did I mention this was by? Uh, yeah, OK, sorry. Uh, his name is right there, Joseph Geron. He's the one who came up with that concept. Um, because he, uh, he described that 20% as the vital few. And the rest he called, that is the 80% of the people who weren't generating most of the sales, he called them the trivial many. Although he did end up changing his mind about that terminology later on, and we'll see why in a minute. So much later, the gambling industry actually coined the term that we usually associate with these big spenders. I think we all are familiar with the term whale. But casinos also had names for uh, mid-level and small-time spenders. And these were dolphins and minnows, respectively. And the casinos did this because they offered a different user experience depending on how much money was being spent by these customers. So the terminology actually struck, stuck. And it's been adopted in, by people in a lot of different industries, including app and game developers and analysts. And you can even find statistics using these terms. So for example, GGG, GGV Capital has done some analysis of freemium mobile games using these terms. And they describe minnows, for instance, the people who pay nothing, as on average accounting for about 90 to 98% of the players in a free-to-play game. Dolphins usually represent about half. And that's counting the revenue. They generate about half of the revenue. Whereas whales typically represent only 3 to 4% of the paying customers, which accounts, amounts to about 1 tenth of 1% of the entire user base. So these are really small numbers. 
Others have actually reported similar results in the broader mobile industry as a whole. So um, really independent of the monetization model. So depending on whether you're using freemium or paid ads, that kind of thing. And the exact percentages vary by source, but everyone seems to agree that there's this very small proportion of customers that account for a relatively large portion of sales. So for, for instance, in 2014, Newzoo estimated that just 3.5% of all their mobile game customers in the US were responsible for a third of all their sales. Google saw 14% of its monthly sales coming from just 1% of its customers in that year. And Congregate had an even more dramatic segmentation in 2015 with one-tenth of 1% 1 of their customer base generating more than half of all their sales. So if we want to fix on one single number, then for simplicity, let's just say 1% of users may be classified as power users. So I mentioned that Joseph Turan had changed his view on the importance of, uh, what do we call them, the non-power users. And originally, he thought of the Pareto principle as the vital few and the trivial many. And he didn't really consider those 8 out of 10 users as significant. They're non-spenders. But that changed because he realized pretty quickly that every customer has value, so even those who don't spend. So first and foremost, because they're all potential power users. All right? they, can, um, they don't necessarily start that way, but they may convert. They may also influence others to try something new. So uh, they help it go viral, for lack of a better word, from the 40s. We'll just use a modern term. Because the more who try, then the more likelihood it is that you're going to reach those potential power users. And of course, you always have the option to use them or to benefit from them as eyeballs for advertising. So I think you were here just a moment ago. Paul described uh, League of Legends and how they tend to um, help promote their users and let them express themselves. They're not the only ones who do this. Uh, you can also look at something like um, TripAdvisor, which uses gamification really successfully to increase their user engagement and build this deeper relationship with their users. So why don't we use the common term in this session? We're using the term power users. We're not really using the term whale. And the truth is, it's always had this kind of uh, negative connotation, this pejorative sense, even if it is just a reflection of practical reality. right? It's just a very straightforward monetization segmentation. But um, Nicholas Lowell. Lovell, who is the author of The Curve, which I highly recommend, uh, described a simple test to identify exploitive revenue generation and uh, classify it differently from, I guess you would call it, clean monetization. So you can generally assume that there's no exploitation if a customer is spending because they just love what you do. On the other hand, if they spend because something in their personality just causes them to spend no matter what's on offer, then that revenue is questionable. And that's what I think most people tend to associate when, uh, with, with revenue generated from people, what people call whales. So that's why we tend to prefer the definition of power user that describes somebody as someone who spends money because they just love what you do, not because they can't help themselves. So as an app publisher and app store, Amazon has our own perspective on power users. And here's what the term means to us. So we define them in this way. Power users spend about $50, or 32 pounds, I think, 32 pounds per month or more. Oh yeah, I even put it up there, 32 pounds. Uh, on average, they actually spend more. They spend about 130 pounds a month. Most are in the US, Japan, and then following that, they're in the UK and Germany. But no country or region has a monopoly. So we see, actually see power users from all over the world. We also see that power users tend to focus on a small number of favorite apps. Uh, two, actually. In fact, eight out of 10 customers who spent $1,000, uh, 650 pounds in January last year, spent 75% it on spent 75 of that money on just two apps. That's a lot of money. I don't spend that much on the App Store every month. 
But, um, but obviously, you want that individual using your app instead of your competitions. And knowing that these power users, these people who spend, concentrate on such a small number of apps, is there anything that you personally should do differently when you publish or market yours? It's an interesting question, so keep, hold that thought. Power users in our store use apps in a lot of different genres, which is a surprise, because traditional wisdom, going back all the way to, say, 1998, so we're talking last century, um, well, it held that you really had to have an MMO, a massively multiplayer online game, to attract and hold these power users, because it was thought that MMOs were really the only apps with the depth to support the engagement that you need uh, for, power for true power user level. King proved, however, with Candy Crush Saga that power users also like casual games. So I think King's success actually gave a lot of people uh, encouragement. They thought, oh, OK, uh, maybe I can make this happen in my game too, or maybe make it happen in my app. And in fact, there are a bunch of other apps that follow suit, and they're not just games. So you think about productivity apps, uh, social apps, lifestyle apps, things like Evernote, Trello, Facebook, Pinterest. People engage with these apps really, really deeply. OK, so now we know power users uh, are more engaged. They spend more than regular users. We even have a ballpark figure on what that means. And we know they like to focus on one or two apps, at least when it comes to spending their money. So, uh, so what? Well, a second ago, I asked you how you would change your marketing strategy given this information. And as a first step, maybe we should take a look at basic performance metrics that we use to gauge our success. So we should see how power users figure into these. And it turns out that some of the most important metrics uh, and most widely used statistics are actually heavily influenced by power user behavior. So if you don't account for these power users, then you risk having holes in your understanding of how your app is really doing. So averages like ARPU, or RPPU, average revenue per user, average revenue per paying user. They provide useful insights, but they're most meaningful when the data actually follows a bell curve. So there are a lot of examples of this kind of data. You've got biometric stats, you've got flower petals, Seattle rainfall, which is actually not that bad, I'm just saying. But app revenue is not exactly a bell curve at all, actually, by any stretch of the imagination. It, had, it has extremely high variance, which means that the data points are uh, very far apart. They're spread out. And it's usually described better by a power log graph like this. So here I'm actually plotting um, the revenue for every user sorted by their contribution rank. So the spike up front here is the person who spent the most trailing off to the right of the long tail of users who spend next to nothing. And there are other examples of this kind of data, too. So you think about population, city population versus rank, or income distribution, or circle packing, the number of small circles you can fit into a big circle. Um, these are very, uh, very common examples that uh, follow power law. And the thing about power law graphs is that they have a few interesting characteristics. Most notably, there's no useful mean to this graph. There's a median, but that's not usually what you want. That just tells you the midpoint between the lowest and the highest amount, of sp amount spent. And uh, that doesn't really seem that useful. A mean, in the traditional sense of the average, is what gives you a better feeling, really, of what you, each user spends. But since power law graphs don't offer that, um, you kind of have to find another way to interpret this data. So. And in reality, how your revenue is distributed actually is just as important as how much is generated. So understanding which users spend more helps you decide which features to prioritize, obviously the ones that, that they're going to use the most. A-B test results may differ depending on the uh, market segmentation. So you either have to redesign your tests or you have to run them multiple times in different uh, categories. Gameplay or workflow or other behavior may also vary between these segments. So does one workflow lead to power users, or do power users tend to follow one workflow? You're always trying to optimize this funnel 
but you need to be on the lookout for the emergent behavior that may predict uh, power users and optimize those pathways. Knowing how users value your product, that is, with respect to the money they spend in it, also allows you to optimize the pricing. So a fixed price, or assuming that your app is just as valuable to everyone, uh, excludes those who feel it's too expensive, and it caps the amount that people will spend, even though they may feel like it's worth more. So when you apply this one-size-fits-all pricing scheme, you're essentially guaranteeing yourself that you're going to leave money on the table. So what does that mean with respect to the business model we might choose? Well, above all else, free-to-play really is the gateway to your power users. Going back to that data published by GGV Capital, uh, on average, freemium companies have 10 times the number of users and 30% longer sessions, not to mention three to five times the total revenue of comparable paid apps. And it's not under hard to understand why. Uh, Free-to-play removes the barriers to experimentation and engagement. So keep in mind, remember, they're going to be uh, very en engaged with a very small number of apps. And so you want to make it as easy as possible for users to dive in and get excited by what they find. You have to make sure your app is super fast and easy to try out, and this is definitely more likely if there's no upfront cost. Free-to-play also removes the upper limit on spending in a good way, right? Because you never want to put limits on how much somebody can love you or how much they can spend because they love. And the only way to turn a premium app user into a power user is to find something else for them to spend money on. But now you're talking about IP or something similar, and you know, you're crossing that line. Why not just go IP to begin with? Free-to-play also allows users to, to be much more efficient in what they spend. So it allows you to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of your customers, and it allows them to spend on the things that they care about and that they want. Uh, they may not spend as much as they did before or in the same categories, but they get to allocate the funds to the things that are important to them, which leads to a better customer experience, which leads to longer engagement, and overall customer satisfaction, which is never bad. So you think about, well, I don't know if this applies here. In the States, there's this huge movement of cutting the cord. I don't know. You guys have a different TV situation. But basically, with cable in the States, you pay $200 a month, and you get a bunch of channels that you don't care about. And people are realizing that, you know, if I just get rid of cable and pay for HBO, then I get just what I want, and I'm spending the money exactly where I want to. So all of these characteristics mean that free-to-play can lead to comparable revenue at much lower volumes. And customer retention is so much cheaper to spend on than customer acquisition, which is basically all about premium. Premium is all about your spend is going into the customer acquisition. With free-to-play, your spend is going to retaining those customers so they continue to use your app over time. So what's the key to retention? Well, it turns out it's love. I mentioned that a couple times already. The media you consume expresses something about who you are, and your emotional connection goes into the root of how much you're willing to spend. So nobody buys a Seattle Seahawks uh, Super Bowl jersey to remind themselves that the Seattle Seahawks won the 2014 Super Bowl, uh, because everybody knows that the Seattle Seahawks won the 2014 Super Bowl. And if you're unclear, I can explain it. But anyway. <laughs> Um, you don't follow One Republic because you think Counting Stars you know, has a good beat and you can dance to it. You don't follow them around the country. Uh, these are things that people do because they feel emotionally connected. And the same is true of mobile apps, believe it or not. Gameville knows this. This is one example. Here's a game developer who designed special, rare, collectible uh, avatars for Critica White Knights. And they're super cool. They're, they're a great example, actually, of how to demonstrate, uh, they, that demonstrate how scarcity contributes to their desirability. And they also appeal to the completionists out there, the users who take some kind of satisfaction in filling in all the blanks, filling in their complete set of whatever it is they're collecting. Users also spend money to express uh, their personality. Maybe they purchase a specific uh, character shader to identify with somebody that they 
that they like, a favorite magician's guild. Uh, they're connecting with something larger than themselves, something that they find inspiring. Or maybe it's more cliquish, equipment or accessories only worn by a team or music from an obscure band. And in that case, they're setting themselves apart. Sometimes that emotion is wrapped up in the status that they've achieved. So I mentioned TripAdvisor earlier. Uh, you know, they do a great job of rewarding people for achieving certain levels of participation. People may buy these items in order to advertise what they've accomplished like that, where they've been, what they've explored. Uh, I have this thing and you don't, or I have every one of these things, uh, or I have more of these than anyone. So these are ways that users can garner their respect, garner respect for their prowess or their world, worldliness or their experience or their intelligence, etc. So all of these are ways that emotion can play into customers' purchasing, de purchasing decisions and understanding that connection between why people spend and the emotion they're trying to achieve is really fundamental to making your app or actually any product attractive to power users. And more importantly, it's what makes your app or product worthy of their devotion. So let's talk about the practical points that you can keep in mind with respect to power users uh, as you plan, publish, and maintain your app. So at the start, as you begin to design and develop your app, make sure that you plan for the easy entry and engagement. You've heard of flow or getting into the zone. Uh, try to encourage that kind of focus. Don't distract the user. Uh, for instance, unless it's super important, don't put up messaging that uh, interrupts their, uh, their flow in the game. In the same way, you should design in such a way to minimize the context switches and give them a reason to come back whether it's a timed reward or some user interaction that they find pleasant or, or interesting, give them something they can experience only in the app itself. And then finally, server-side storage makes it really easy to move between devices. So their data is accessible from anywhere. They can use uh, any device that's a hand. They pick up right where they left off. My colleague, Mike, actually is going to provide some really interesting uh, statistics on the timing and engagement just after the break, so definitely stick around for that. Then when you're ready to publish your app, make sure your catalog has the items that power users find appealing. So this means there are accessories, like I described, that allow for self-expression, uh, personal taste. If it's a game, have power-ups or buffs that expand their skills or complement abilities that they already have. Include collectible, rare, or award-type items that convey an elite status to satisfy the completionist yearnings. Shortcut items are very popular in some uh, applications that allow users to trade money for time. And finally, balance the price points of your items according to the revenue they generate. And I just I want to throw this graph up because I find it really uh, interesting. This, this is an example of the distribution of price points across our entire store. So I don't know how many millions of items we have for sale in the digital store. These are in-app in purchase items. But the first bar in each group is the percentage of the virtual shelf space devoted to items in that price. So 31% of all our items are 99 cents, 29% are $1.99, etc. down the line. The second bar in this item, in, this, in each item, is how much these price points actually contribute to overall revenue. And you can see way down at the end on the right, those higher priced items, $49, $99, they actually contribute quite a substantial percentage uh, to the overall revenue. Now this is just undifferentiated. This is everybody thrown in a big bucket and how they distribute their prices. But if we look at the top 50 most successful apps in our store, you see a slightly different distribution, radically different in some cases. Now you see those apps are actually including items at the higher price points in greater numbers to great effect, whether or not they're doing this intuitively or because they've done some analysis, but they've basically balanced the distribution of those price points so that the items that are really contributing to the bottom line are more accessible and available. And finally, after your app is actually live in the marketplace, don't forget about it. Don't just fire and forget. Understand that users become less price sensitive over time, meaning they're willing to spend more in your app the more comfortable they are with it. And I think uh, Mike is going to talk about that as well. 
make sure you continue to provide new and interesting content, so keep it fresh. The more content, the better. And make it really clear what value is available at each price point. So don't overload them with a lot of different um, prices. You can have tons of content, but just make sure they are bucketed into a manageable amount of uh, price points. Again, he's going to share some great analysis, and you'll get some hard numbers, which I think are really fascinating. Uh, you know, above all else, just treat the customer well. All they're looking for is an interesting, engaging, uh, enjoyable life experience. That's what everybody wants in an app. So we can help. I think Paul may have shown this slide earlier, um, but it's worth repeating. <laughs> Most Amazon developers make more than $500 a month, so that isn't the case for all the app stores out there. We also sell around the world, so we're actually available in 236 different countries and territories, including some that are traditionally difficult to reach, so China, Indonesia, the Middle East, etc. And customers in a lot of those countries can actually purchase in their own local currency, which makes it uh, much easier to use their preferred payment method. They don't have to have a US-based credit card, for instance. We also have a bunch of SDKs and add-ons, uh, which allow you to connect to several of our cloud services. So they handle purchasing or synchronization, notifications, other tasks that help you engage your customers and generate revenue. And you can also take advantage of special hardware. So for instance, Amazon Echo. Uh, or you can use some advanced features that are built into the Fire OS. And the beauty of it is it's super easy to get started. Really, you just need to register and submit. That's all there is to it. So what do, we, what do we get from this? Power users really drive revenue. Don't ignore them. It turns out there are no trivial few. Every customer is a potential power user, or they can help you reach one. And emotion is the primary reason that they purchase. So how do you engage your power users, encourage regular customers to join their ranks? You need to plan for them. Just engage them at every stage. You need to enable purchases that scratch some kind of emotional itch. And again, as I said, you know, this includes self-expression, collecting, achievement, status, advancement, that kind of thing. And finally, you need to grow with them. So keep your catalog fresh, balance the price points, and offer uh, lots of content for them to buy as they become more comfortable with your app. That's it. I hope you'll stick around for Mike's talk after the break. It's really uh, fascinating. There's a lot of great statistical information. And uh, if you're going to switch over to the other track, then we've got some uh, data on how to port between uh, Unity and HTML. Wait, no. Porting Unity games to Fire Devices. That's, that's right. And uh, I'll be right outside, actually, if you have any questions about uh, the content. And thank you very much. <laughs>